Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Savings by Design Air Tightness Part 1 webinar. And my name is Adam Jones from Sustainable Buildings Canada, and I, along with my colleague Amy Pound, will be managing the webinar today. Um, if I can advance the slide, I'll introduce our, our presentation team today. We have Dr. Randy Van Stratton from RGH Building Science, Kara Sloat from Reinbold Engineering, and Bettina Hoare uh, from Sage Living Toronto. Uh, the presentation today is predominantly focused on stack effect, and if you've signed up for tomorrow's presentation, it's a little bit more focused on testing, um, air testing, air tightness testing, my apologies, um, and case studies on that. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Mary Sai from Enbridge Gas. Thanks, Adam. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our fourth webinar presented by Enbridge Gas and Sustainable Buildings Canada. This is a one part of a two part series. As Adam said, tomorrow will be the second one. Um, my name is Mary Sai and I'm from Enbridge Gas and I'm the energy advisor for our commercial new construction savings by design program. The audience today is a very broad mixture of municipalities, developers and consultants, industry reps, academics and nonprofits. Our goal is to give an overview and provide solutions as to designing an airtight building and to answer questions about how to achieve this using our Savings by Design workshop. For those of you not familiar with Savings by Design, it's an Enbridge program that is facilitated by Sustainable Buildings Canada, which supports builders and developers to achieve 15% combined energy efficiency above current code. Please reach out to me should you want to learn more. Following the webinar today, a link will be sent out as to how to access the information that is presented. The webinar today will also be recorded, so don't worry if there's a few things you may have missed, as you'll have another chance to review the content. Also, we'd love to hear from you as how we're doing um, during the Q&A after the webinar, so please hold off any questions until then. If you'd like to reach out to me directly, I can be contacted at mary, M-A-R-Y dot sci, S-Y-E at Enbridge.com, or you can call me on my cell at 416-420-9281. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks again for joining today, and I'll hand it off to Sustainable Buildings Canada to begin. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Um, so allow me to just one, one minute to describe how the, the system works today. Uh, we'll be having a, a joint presentation from Carrie, Randy, Kara, Randy, and Bettina. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to type them out in the question box. And what we'll do is we'll save those up. And at the end of the presentation, um, we will either read those uh, to the group to request an answer, or we will open up the microphone um, if you have made a uh, type out a question and allow you to ask directly. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Randy Van Stratton to begin the presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. I pressed that button twice. I don't know how to go backwards. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about air leakage and a focus on stack effect and compartmentalization and indoor air quality uh, impacts. And um, some of the uh, air tightness stuff, we'll probably, you'll hear some of it uh, tomorrow also by uh, WSP, our friends there. Um, so this will be a great coverage of the uh, topic. But basically, you know, air leakage, you basically need uh, holes that air can go through and you need pressures that drive the air through those holes. And so this is a very common uh, set of uh, sketches on this. Uh, basically on the left, you have stack pressure, stack effect pressure, you know, hot air rises. So this is illustrating the winter time. Uh, mechanical systems, we're kind of focused on MERVs here. So often we're pressurizing corridors and overall pressurizing the uh, building. And then also wind effects, which can vary greatly depending on exposure. And when all of those are combined, you sort of get this illustration at the bottom. And once, effect, once again, you have you know, stack effect ruling the day to some extent where air is being pushed up uh, the building and uh, outward. Um, so a bit on the importance of air leakage. Um, building energy uh, consumption. So this is the focus nowadays. Uh, saving money on energy, but also reducing CO2 impacts of operating. Um, part of that, and a point I added to the slide, I sort of stole it from a colleague, uh, building HVAC capacity. 
So one of the tricks that Kara will talk about uh, at the workshops that we attend, uh, which is fairly common amongst all the low, low energy buildings, is they have awesome enclosures. And part of having awesome enclosures is low amounts of air leakage. And so those two are really tied together. Uh, Bettina, I'm sure, will do a great job covering indoor air quality. Uh, also, building durability. So the same holes that let air in potentially let rain in. None of them are intentional. Um, so uh, that's that's obviously a concern. And then there's been a big focus in the building enclosure industry of late of uh, looking at air leakage condensation and how that ends up uh, adding moisture to our walls and uh, roofs and whatnot. And then, of course, occupant comfort. Uh, so hearing traffic outside the building, um, drafts um, caused by air leakage, you know, big concerns. And a couple statistics down there that I see repeated uh, again and again, um, you know, buildings are a significant portion, their operating energy use, significant portion of CO2 impacts, energy use, and different studies probably vary on this, but uh, this is one that's commonly, or two that are commonly uh, touted. Uh, estimating about 10%, and that's focused on uh, multi-unit residential buildings. Uh, so air leakage is a, a big uh, dent on your energy use. And um, you know we often uh, cross this at our uh, workshops. And so the the small photo on the left, that's my colleague uh, Alex, who's standing up there grinning, and uh, David Peterson, Larry Bryden, some common folks at SPC workshops, which I encourage everybody to uh, participate in. Um, you know, free of charge, basically get uh, input on your projects and uh, some insights on this stuff, as well as, you know, I would encourage everybody to look publicly. There's more and more documents coming out. Uh, this is just one from BC Housing that we put together, uh, trying to share our knowledge and insights on uh, achieving air tightness in buildings. And some of the things that you'll find, uh, at least in that guide and common in these workshops, uh, you know, the basics on how you're building up your air barrier, what are the materials, uh, that, that are the components of it, uh, maybe differences, implications of these different materials are very project specific. It's kind of like there's not one magic way to achieve an airtight building. There's probably airtight buildings of large, vast variety of different materials being used, uh, but that off obviously needs to be thought through. And then the detailing is the trick. So when I see infrared pictures of commercial buildings, you know, identifying air leakage issues, uh, all the little circles here are common spots where you see uh, the the infrared pictures light up where they're having uh, issues, and it tends to be at the interfaces between systems. And so we're asking for more and more details nowadays, and then also to trace the air barrier through those details, make sure it's continuous, and also that it's continuous between the detail and the wall beside it, that everyone understands where the intended air barrier is. Uh, obviously very important. Uh, and then the next one being field review. And so uh, if anybody works uh, as an architect or enclosure consultant, uh, often you're not every day there every day to see what's being implemented, but how do you go about trying to ensure that the air barrier has been installed in such a way that's gonna be effective? The photo here, I'm standing in the background, it's kind of a cold December day, and we were warming our hands with the amount of air that was leaking from that parapet. Um, I know there was an earlier slide showing an air barrier separating the parapet from the uh, the rest of the building, and uh, that's often poorly done uh, nowadays. And uh, you know, in this case, definitely wish we had caught it earlier. Uh, becomes um, you know a bit of a challenge and normal part of construction to have to deal with these issues. But at least we identified it at this point, as opposed to waiting for this parapet to rot out to try to uh, resolve it. And these various efforts and the focus on uh, air tightness and air barriers being a priority, we have some evidence to suggest that you know commercial buildings, not just houses, are getting more airtight over time. The data that's shown here is from across North America. It's a study that my colleague Lauren Ricketts had done a couple of years back for uh, NRC. And you basically see that slowly, and there's some uh, dots that don't quite fit the the criteria, but over time, buildings seem to be getting more and more uh, airtight. And this data set is from testing. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about testing because I know it's also gonna be covered uh, again tomorrow. And one thing I wanted to touch on, which I found interesting, I don't know if everybody in Ontario is really uh, aware of this, 
but there's lots of air tightness uh, standards that are out there already being implemented and enforced. The sort of first one that I really knew about outside of housing was U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, you know, they have buildings or constantly building buildings all across the states, all different climates, all kinds of different contractors with different priorities. And uh, they implemented a rather rigorous uh, air tightness requirement that they enforce. And thou shalt make good in your contract. It's a performance requirement that they're going to test and check. Uh, the next two that I was aware of were uh, Washington State and Seattle kind of had their own spin on Washington State's requirement for air tightness testing. So right now there's an awful lot of large commercial buildings being tested uh, in Seattle and across uh, Washington State with uh, great success and generally good feedback from the uh, building community. Uh, and then we see the BC step code pushing for more and more buildings uh, having required uh, air tightness testing and Toronto Green Standard Tier 2 and Plus requiring air tightness testing. It's kind of coming to the forefront. And part of the reason why I wanted to add this, I have a bit of a, uh, a, a gr an ax to grind. Uh, I sat on a CGBC committee when lead version 4 came to Canada, and I think they really missed the, the buck uh, with their building enclosure commissioning credit and not at least requiring air tightness testing. I think you know, right now leadership is air tightness testing in the industry. And unfortunately that one was uh, was missed. And then the bigger one, uh, there was a uh, proposal for NECB, the committees that sit on those standards, they put forth a uh, requirement to test uh, whole buildings uh, for air, or the air tightness of whole buildings uh, across Canada. And that was something that was put forth very similar to what they did in Washington, Seattle, where they required testing and there wasn't, uh, a hard and fast target, but at least to get the ball rolling on hitting standards and also just to inform people when they do this testing, you see holes and it kind of shames everybody to do better next time or kind of proves the point that, hey, that really wasn't effective, um, whatever the approach happens to be. And uh, we were there was a hope to go and spread this across Canada. And unfortunately, this is one of the very noteworthy uh, changes that uh, got dropped. And so every opportunity I have, I'm trying to uh, to point this out and get a bit of uh, uh, the public focus on and the industry focus that uh, unfortunately Canada probably missing a step forward here if they're delaying this uh, this particular uh, option in building code. I'm gonna go over a couple of basics on air tightness testing. Um, so stack effect, you know, this is from the earlier slide, I think right at the beginning uh, showing, you know, uh, negative pressure at the bottom, positive pressure at the top when it's uh, cold out. And generally the idea with smaller buildings is that we test them to very high pressure, 75 pascals or rather high pressure. Um, and that overwhelms, if you look at the cumulative one on the right, it overwhelms most of the stack effect pressures on a, on, on a smaller building like a house. Once you, you when you deal with smaller buildings, like six to maybe 10 story, uh, we do see them tested with just blower doors on the main floor. And essentially what they've done is they've taken the technology which was done for houses, which was a shroud and one lower capacity fan and put in higher capacity fans, stronger fans basically, made ways so that you could add multiple fans per door. And that's essentially how we cover smaller buildings. When you get a little bit bigger, um, that gets more difficult because these stack pressures, you know, hot air rising creates pressure, um, starts to add up and uh, it becomes more and more significant. And so then we'll look to put doors um, up in the penthouse, um, if we can, within patio doors. And the photo here is from a building we tested in Seattle. Uh, it's also a bit easier in a more mild climate where you can match the indoor temperature to the outdoor temperature through more of the year. In Toronto uh, and across much of Canada, that's less uh, realistic. Oh, not sure what happened there. Did I do that, Adam? My apologies. And now the exciting part of what we're seeing today, and this will probably be discussed tomorrow because everyone's sort of playing with this topic, is uh, we're taking these uh, taller monsters and how do you do whole building air test tightness testing on a 60-story building? Uh, both in terms of construction scheduling and just in terms of uh, controlling pressure and applying um, sort of that much, blowing that much air into a building. And so there's lots of folks who are playing right now with testing one floor at a time where they basically bring the floor on top and below up to the same pressure as your test pressure. 
so that ideally all the air that's sort of leaking in or leaking out of that floor is all through the envelope and not up and down. Um, very sort of new at this point would be my comment on it. I haven't seen a whole lot of repeatability and reproducibility testing on it as a scientist. Uh, repeatability is sort of if you went and did the test and you show up later that night and did the test again, would you get the same result? And then reproducibility that if, say, we came in and tested one day and the good folks at WSP came tomorrow and did the same test, how far off would those results be? And if they're way off, then it's you know difficult to rely on them for code and for design. And if they're quite close, uh, then it's a bit more promising. Um, right now, there's a variety of uh, projects out there that are looking uh, at these issues. And I do have some uh, colleagues that published on this recently. So uh, within the slide set, which everyone will get, you see lots of little references. Uh, and they included some differences between uh, whole building and, and guarded tests. I won't go over in detail. And this is kind of my uh, handoff slide. If you're ever involved with this work, this is from a eight-story building I tested in Seattle. It is a lot of exercise. There's basically carrying and lugging all this equipment all over the building. And I say this as an engineer, if any contractors on this webinar, they're probably rolling their eyes right now. And it is a lot of equipment. Um, so it's quite, a, quite an exercise. Uh, and if you ever get a chance to participate in one of these tests, I'd highly recommend it and go full bore and uh, try to get involved with it. And I think I hand off to Kara now. Yes, I think so. Everyone can hear me okay. So I bring the mechanical engineering perspective to this conversation. One of the considerations when we're trying to design our systems, we have uh, the obligation to bring fresh air for breathing to every suite. And this uh, recent COVID um, crisis has only highlighted the requirement that proper ventilation be provided. We also need to prevent odor transfer from suite to suite to create uh, feelings of positive uh, experience for everyone who's living there and to avoid occupant complaints. And the problem is that when stack effects are acting on buildings and especially in an uncontrolled way, you end up with an inability for the mechanical system to fight those pressures. So, my favorite study highlighting how the building envelope and the mechanical system work together uh, in a building is a study that was actually done by Randy's colleagues at RDH. Um, they instrumented up a 13-story multi-unit residential building in Vancouver, Canada. It had 37 residential suites. Although it was an older building, it had a complete enclosure renewal. So the building should have been reasonably airtight. It had one below grade parking garage and it was pressurizing the corridors using a makeup air unit. So it was a pretty typical system for a high rise residential building. So what they found when they instrumented up the building was that the makeup air unit because of stack effect, um, was only able to properly ventilate the top three floors of the building. What you're looking at here is tracer gas that was placed into the makeup air unit and looking at the levels that actually were found in the building. So the corridors were reasonably well ventilated, but the actual building um, only saw uh, ventilation at the top and the bottom uh, and a very poor distribution throughout the building. On the other hand, air from the parking garage was nearly 100% ventilating the bottom three floors of this building. So tracer grass released in the parking garage was found all the way up to the fourth floor. So is this going to be a problem all year round? No, you will see differences depending on how tall your building is, what climate zone it is, and what time of year it is. This graph shows uh, how different uh, factors were influencing air movement, air movement at the top of the building uh, over the course of the entire year. So in green, you can see wind uh, influencing movement in a highly variable way. Stack effect has a significant effect, up to 50% during some of the winter months and very little in the summer. And the mechanical system although it is trying to control air movement in the building, only has 20 to 50% influence most of the year. 
The result of this is that our buildings aren't performing to design. So on average, the buildings that we've built in Toronto, we've had to do energy models for since uh, the last 2012, I think, code update. And they use on average 13% more energy than was predicted by modeling. And the majority of that energy is in heating, 24% um, higher gas use than is predicted. Bettina, do you wanna talk a little bit about the thermal comfort findings? Sure, and in that same study, what they found was um, just on one measure of comfort, thermal comfort, so that's the Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, only 11% of buildings where 80% of occupants or more were uh, actually felt thermally comfortable. So, you know, we put that down to poor enclosures, potentially, but mostly things that we could catch through good commissioning, ex you know, extensive commissioning. And so I guess I'll just continue from here. So that's just one measure of comfort, as I said, thermal comfort. Uh, but we want to be cognizant that there are many measures of comfort. There's acoustic comfort, which is also affected if uh, if there are flanking issues between suites, between rooms, or to the exterior. If there's any movement of air, then there will be movement of sound. Uh, visual comfort is not direct, directly related to the vision, but often when we're looking at where we place windows and doors, uh, we sort of do them in a cookie cutter sort of style rather than actually considering what is the view that this window, which is the most expensive and least effective performing element of my uh, thermal envelope, what is it actually looking at? What is the purpose of this window? Is there, is there a view? Is there a light? Uh, ergonomic comfort is simply the design of the comfort of the indoors. Biophilia is this feeling that because we're animals, we like to feel comfortable when we have indoors. And to, to achieve that, we need natural uh, elements. So vinyl windows are cheap. Wood windows actually give us a sense of being in something that is natural. So sometimes your even your material choices have factors other than just energy or air tightness or what have you. And of course, your air quality is going to be affected by how well you control the air. Can odors, particulates, and elements, other elements get through into and through suites? If it clicks, yay. Um, so we know for a fact that the built environment, uh, Randy showed a, a lovely slide with uh, the kissy couple, as we like to call them. Well, the kissy couple, they looked quite happy as they were embarking on this voyage into their uh, into their condo. Um, and that's what we hope for when we're building, or especially something that we're going to be building, uh, both from a reputational point of view, if it's something we're eventually selling off, or if it's a building that we're going to be controlling because we're going to be renting it in the future. And so to get that kissy couple, there are a number of factors that we want to think about. And we want one of them is that the built environment very clearly affects our health and wellness. Um, there is a difference. Oh, pardon me. There, there is a difference between health and wellness. And I think it's a it's a helpful uh, tiny bit of vocabulary for those of you who may not have considered some of it before. Um, I looked to the World Health Organization for their definition of health. Uh, for those of you that are financial type people, uh, it's like your balance sheet. It's a snap snapshot where you are at this moment, uh, physically, mentally, and socially. Whereas wellness, as defined by the Global Wellness Institute, something that only came about in 2007, is a much broader, it's an active process. It's your income statement or your cash flow, if you're thinking in financial terms. It's more a moving picture of how you are physically, emotionally, socially, intellectually, spiritually, and occupationally. So it's much broader. And how those two things interact is very much the same as what we've seen in the medical field. In the medical field, it used to be you would go to your doctor if you felt sick or you had disease. And we would take away things in the built environment if we knew that they caused harm, like lead and asbestos, what have you. But we're very much now, as in medicine, where we're moving more towards a wellness paradigm, we're beginning to understand that we can do more to make buildings better for the people inside the buildings. Imagine that. So uh, just like Randy mentioned that code for some of these things, we've, we've missed the boat. And, and 
of course, we don't want to overcode and over examine things, but just to give you an example, the code for formaldehyde, uh, something that we know is toxic and carcinogenic and is ubiquitous in the building uh, field, well, that's been uh, illegal in California, Japan, Europe, et cetera, and we're still in our second reading here in Canada on that kind of legislation. So what can we do? There we go. Um, some of the things that we want to be cognizant when we're thinking about health and wellness in the built environment and how things like air tightness can affect those people is we have to remember that people come in all sorts of sizes, shapes, and abilities. So things like where your doors and your windows are placed can influence the person's comfort. Are they able to open up a window to get fresh air? Is it physically to their stature or do they have the strength and dexterity to be able to open that window to get the fresh air if this is something that they're counting on? We also have a growing aging population who are more vulnerable. And uh, there are many, the, the more we can control the environment that they live in, the better we can accommodate any particular needs that they might have. Sorry, we're learning this. Oof. Can either of you? There we go. There we go. I was going to say, I think you're doing it. All right. Last slide, pardon me. So we want to control the air because it will control indoor air quality. It will control acoustic and thermal comfort because any leaks or gaps in that are going to be affecting how sound and air travel sand smells. Uh, not only are they going to make discomfort for your occupants, they can also create damage to the actual physical environment. If anytime you have air leakage, you're going to have moisture leakage that makes conducive to mold growth. Uh, you're going to have infiltration of pests and insufficient fresh air. Those slides that Kara showed are, are to me very jarring and, and impressive. Kara, on to you. What can we do? so that the humans are more comfortable Perfect. and energy is saved. So our HVAC systems bring in fresh air, but um, outdoor air pollution is an important factor that has to be controlled as we are actually moving air through the buildings. So having operable windows is actually really important, but so is thinking about the treatment of both recirculated air and new air that's coming into the building. So when we're building in the GTA specifically, having an idea of what kind of um, industrial uses surround your building. Um, when you're building, for instance, near the Red Path Sugar Factory, there's very specific filtration that has to be done on intake air to be able to avoid contamination um, that could impact the health of people living in your buildings. So it is possible to exceed the performance targets that you set in the design phase. Um, we said earlier that about 10% um, Sorry, about 13% on average is the amount of energy that's used by a building more than what it had originally targeted. But you can see in this graph, um, the EUI metered, so that's the energy use intensity of uh, multi-unit residential buildings. And this is multi-unit residential buildings specifically in Toronto uh, versus the calibrated energy models that were prepared. This is a study that was done by Sidewalk Labs um, trying to figure out what problems needed to be solved in our industry. And while the majority of buildings are using more energy than their energy models, they're there are some examples that used less. So building nine and building 17, we have to track them down and ask them what they're doing properly. And the next few slides um, contain my theories about what you can do to uh, create this interaction that works between um, that well-constructed building envelope and the other systems that work together to create healthy air and appropriate energy use. So, in the RDH study, where they looked at um, where all of this air went with the tracer gas, what we found out is that 40% of the air they were putting into that building went straight up the elevator shaft instead of ending up in a suite or in any place where people were actually breathing. 10% um, went up the electrical closets, garbage shoes, sort of other uses, and 30% went up the stairwells. So these vertical circulation paths 
are 70% of the vulnerability that they found in that building, even after the exterior building retrofit had been done. Only 20% of the air that they were putting into that building made it into suites through the door undercuts in the corridors. Um, and this is made worse for new buildings because these suite door undercuts, which had been a um, relied upon feature of multi-unit residential construction were reduced in 2016 by uh, updates to the fire code. So we used to try and get a half inch door undercut. It's been cut down from that. So you can get at most 40 CFM per door in around that suite if everything went right, and we know that it doesn't. So instead, what we recommend is that individual sweet energy recovery ventilators be provided and that fresh air be individually ducted to each suite. Um, and we also recommend that we spend a lot of time as a design team uh, sitting down and working together, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, structural engineers, uh, building envelope and architects as a group to have a conversation about how we make each of these vertical components in the building as airtight as possible. So this slide shows some very specific recommendations moving from top to bottom. That elevator is our biggest vulnerability. So the code was updated to um, avoid the need to have penetrations in that shaft for energy recovery reasons. Um, but we still have air movement from the shaft into the elevator machine room and from the elevator machine room potentially out. So it's important to think of the elevator machine room as a bathtub system, um, as airtight as possible and conditioned entirely with split systems rather than using a grill to allow uh, free uh, air conditioning in through the outside wall. Uh, anywhere where you have penetrations at the top of the building, you'll want uh, certified airtight dampers, AMCA A1 class. Uh, and you can address garbage chute air leakage as well. There are code interpretations that allow you to put a damper on that and use a fan rather than allowing uncontrolled air, as long as you have the ability to open up the top in case of a fire emergency. And there are also high quality garbage shoot door seals that you can specify to reduce air movement through that particular ch chase. Um, we recommend vestibules separating stairs from the top level wherever possible. We recommend not popping the stairwell all the way up to the roof, but separating that with a door. Um, having strict performance requirements for duct tightness so that when you are using a mechanical system to treat air, that air ends up in the spaces, not uh, in the sort of interstitial spaces in the building. Um, and finally, because we know the stack effect is very different at the top and the bottom, and we want to really avoid movement from the parking level and up into the suites, uh, having a separate air handler for the lobby and below grade that can maintain a separate pressure regime from the unit above so that you can reboost the amount of fresh air that you're getting and control it properly. We saw that wind was up to 50% of the uh, air moving driving force, sometimes a little more. So we do need to think very carefully about how it impacts the building. Um, as mechanical engineers and architects moving off of the building science side, the biggest place that we have uh, influence is thinking about how people use the building. So what I'm illustrating on this slide is actually a biggest, the biggest point of vulnerability, which is that main entry door. Um, and thinking about ways that you can minimize air movement uh, driven by wind, especially in the winter where we know that we're seeing large air conditioning loads. So in the winter, if you have a wind rose, you can actually produce one of these for whichever uh, location that you're designing in um, to be able to see which way the wind blows most of the time. And often it, it is quite uh, notably a dominant direction in Toronto. That's a sort of west, southwestern wind. So if this wind was blowing on this vestibule configuration that you see at right, um, the architect in question would have done a really good job because the primary way that people are intended to enter the building that you see here on the right would be to walk in the vestibule and then take a right hand turn down uh, and into the building, which means that wind can't blow through the first set of doors and the second set of doors in a straight line. So the only time that's going to happen is if you're using uh, this little sort of cubby room. Uh, so that's reasonably effective design. Um, 
when we see sort of really big vulnerabilities is when we have a central atrium uh, and doors on either end that the wind can blow straight through. Uh, and that can actually induce air movement uh, even in this, the floors above grade, again, because of those interconnected systems. So having more than one set of doors in the lobby between uh, the entrance and the elevator on the high-rise buildings can also further reduce these influences. Our next recommendation is to consider having a variable speed makeup air unit. Um, and the reason we recommend this is that to achieve TGS Tier 2's targets, um, the makeup air is the biggest single driver of uh, Teddy that you can influence as a designer. So the thermal energy demand index, uh, which is how much heat the building requires over the course of the year, can be reduced if you need less makeup air in the corridors. But of course, if we're losing it all through our elevator shafts, um, we'll need to put more in to be able to get the performance that we need. So um, accommodating the differences in seasonal shifts with this unit using a pressure sensor placed about two thirds of the way down the duct above the neutral plane to be able to detect differences in the actual uh, performance of the building rather than um, delivering the highest quantity of air at all periods of time will provide significant energy reductions without introducing risk that um, in peak periods, you won't have odor control or that you won't have proper building pressurization. Within the suites, energy recovery ventilation from the outside of the building into each suite is what we recommend. And there are um, high performance units coming out on the market at quite low cost that can further reduce the energy required to be able to ventilate buildings. Um, these units often include what are called EC motors, and these motors uh, automatically pressure balance. So they have electronics in them that allow them to move faster when the wind is uh, blowing in a direction that is fighting them and slower when the wind is actually blowing on the intake so that you can get better performance out of the building without having to put a lot of active systems in place. We recommend that dryer vents, which are a hole in the building envelope that is not connected to a very effective seal, um, have as good of a damper on them as possible. Um, they need, maybe Randy, do you want to comment on some of the building science elements on this slide? Yes, no? Well, I, I think what you're getting at is, uh... When you look at uh, airtight buildings, you do testing, often mechanical penetrations are a weak spot. And so, you know, uh, a, a responsibility gets uh, can get complicated when you have mechanical overlapping with enclosure elements and who's responsible to seal it in properly. And um, yeah, so it's often a weak spot, basically the connection on the outside of that duct and the surrounding uh, enclosure. And so making sure that that's uh, sealed properly is uh, definitely a big deal. Um, could go into different discussion about dampers, but uh, anyway, we'll, we'll save that if someone has a question at the end. Perfect. Well, and as a mechanical engineer, of course, there is this interface where I know exactly what I want out of the damper, but need to work very carefully with the building science guys to make sure that uh, both the penetration itself and the performance of the hole in the wall uh, are addressed separately. Um, a really easy answer to that particular penetration is to move to ventless dryers. So these systems have been getting better over time. They do require a ventilated closet uh, with enough space around it and enough um, openings to outside. So typically that's a louvered door on the, on the laundry closet to be able to allow air to circulate but they give 50% energy savings and they eliminate this penetration and the whole conversation about uh, who is responsible for dampers and who is responsible for air sealing. So these are some of the solutions we see to the challenge of stack effect in high-rise towers and some of the transitions we're hoping to see through uh, the next iterations of uh, construction in Toronto in the coming years. We, we don't have the answers to everything. So one of the big considerations is that fresh air intake location. We know that we're trying to avoid 
bringing in contaminants, but I'm recommending that we separately pressurize the main floor and the parking garage levels. So the intake for that unit is usually at low level somewhere in an urban environment. So coordinating how that air comes into the building can be quite important. When there's driving forces against having makeup air units at high level, uh, that can also be a challenge because again, it drives the source of fresh air farther away from where uncontaminated air is. Uh, and within the energy recovery ventilation units in suite, those are typically ducted directly to the side walls, which can expose them to uh, smoke from adjacent balconies uh, and contaminants from adjacent suites. Um, we've talked about accessibility and making buildings uh, support wellness. If we have flush thresholds at the openings of apartments, then we're creating a channel for air movement out of the corridor and into suites, which we then can't control. So we don't have a great answer for how to control that air movement. And then finally, the garbage chutes. Um, they're a giant hole in the building. There are some minor things we can do to help move that, but um, I think there's still a lot of work to be done there. Any any other challenges you guys want to highlight here? I, I think the typical trade-off is energy for comfort. And so what you have shown is if you control how and where the air comes in well, for instance, and Fitwell both want you to have higher CFM, which means higher energy cost, but there are ways of achieving better air flow to the humans directly where they are. Then, and then you can solve both issues. But it, but they are, they can be painful trade-offs because it takes careful thought. Yeah, I think the one I would bring up is, is right now uh, air tightness testing, and uh, being able to do it commonly at a commonly and at a reasonable cost that's just integrated into uh, construction of buildings where it wouldn't be questioned and you don't have all the value engineering uh, arguments as much. And then you can reliably take advantage of the benefits, both in terms of HVAC sizing and uh, expectations of performance and then ideally the corresponding improvements over time of you know, measuring, seeing where your leaks are. Next time that contractor works on a project, learning from that example, the architects learn, everyone learning from that example and uh, moving forward a bit more quickly toward uh, more airtight buildings. Okay. So. so to summarize what we've recommended, uh, tier one, what we're recommending for every building is basic suite to suite compartmentalization. So having fresh air individually in introduced into every suite because otherwise you're not going to be sure you're actually getting that air where you want it. Randy's recommended whole building or guarded air tightness testing. Um, and as a mechanical engineer, I'm, I'm also thinking that is great. Um, Energy Star rated energy recovery ventilators, especially with those EC motors so that you get the performance you're looking for from the unit, regardless of whether it's been uh, effectively balanced. Um, finally, looking to highest performance, um, we are recommending that each project set high air tightness targets and think about how they will test throughout the project to make sure that those goals are achieved. Um, Passive House does a phenomenal job of bringing the entire team on board. And if you Google Passive House air tightness testing, you will see pictures of uh, very happy, smiling teams with 40 or 50 people sitting behind their air tightness testing number, um, which is really where we'd like to get everyone, um, regardless of whether or not they're aiming for an ultra low target, but seeing it as a group responsibility and something that we can really be proud of when we finish our buildings. Um, and then looking at minimizing intakes and exhausts. Bettina, do you want to talk about this last one? Uh, it is available now. We can, there is even a certification called RESET that you can get. Um, what gets measured, get done is the old adage. So uh, measuring indoor air quality now is actually quite possible and quite relatively inexpensive at this point. So uh, something to keep in mind that your your future customers could be measuring it as well. And if you are responsible for that future air, if, as thinking of future proofing, what can we do to make 
the air quality the best indoors for our future customers. Okay, I think that's it. So um, we're really excited about taking all of your questions. Okay, uh, thank you all very much for a very informative uh, discussion. Um, we will indeed go over to the, the questions now. Um, Amy, do you have any questions queued up? Um, yes, we had a few questions come in. Let's see. Okay. Um, so we have one from Rob Marshall. Uh, he said, very good knowledge, Ministry of Housing and ONHWP published a condominium construction guide in 1991 that is referenced uh, in NBC with so little progress towards energy efficient, healthy housing almost 30 years later. What actions are needed for advancement in buildings we spend 90% of our time in? So we, uh, our last slide there, I think, sort of highlighted my key recommendations and the whole team's ideas. Uh, anything that we didn't mention there that you guys want to see? Well, I would add, we know that ASHRAE, for instance, is coming up with uh, improved standards, and they're at the forefront. Uh, and there's a ton of wonderful information in the ASHRAE standards, but people don't know to access and use all of that information to actually to get them make the most of it. So so I'm a huge fan of regulation, the more the merrier, because then we all have to work to the same standard. And at the same time, if we stop at regulation, then it doesn't encourage us to dig deeper and see how much better we can do, which is one of the great things about the Savings by Design program is it encourages us to just think beyond that regulation box. Yeah, I, I can feel for Rob's uh, frustration. Uh, I know Rob Marshall, and he's probably aware of studies that were done a long time ago. Uh, I know Joe Stevrick's PhD was done on compartmentalization and uh, seeing the very slow progress there. I'm excited that, you know, more and more people are interpreting ASHRAE, that thou shalt do compartmentalization. Um, and as that spreads across more cities, it's exciting to see that happen. And then, you know, resolving all the issues that may come along with it. You know, people smoking pot out in their patios and smelling it next door. And how do you resolve all these issues? Um, I, I'm glad to see us at least moving forward now to require this uh, people get proper ventilation to begin with and uh, how it'll cascade to be reflected in the industry, you know, cost wise, performance wise is very, very, I don't know, very exciting to me. So that, that seems like a, a big one in, in MERBs at this point. I think that the suggestion of indoor air quality monitoring can go along with indoor air quality standards that are easily accessible to occupants and that could go a really long way so that occupants would actually understand when their CO2 levels are inappropriate and be able to talk to their landlords about it. Yeah. Great, uh, okay. we have another? Yeah, oh, sorry, I'll go ahead. Uh, we have another question here, uh, a terrific presentation to the team. Um, this is from Thomas Gervais. In terms of the NECB, what was the objective to air tightness testing? Uh, costing or just technology for high-rise constru construction? So that's, a, I, guess, I suppose, a two-part question. What's the objection in NECB? Uh, I'm not clear what the objection was. Like when the, uh, the code change proposal was put through, they had it back with um addressing the technical and the cost ends of it obviously it's it's not free um cost wise and obviously there's some hassle with construction so i'm actually not in the know of uh, why they turned it down and I, i'm not 100 sure if that's public not or not at this point i know the iu uh was the other big uh debate going from percent energy savings to absolute targets and they were worried that that was going to uh, uh, hampen the industry's ability to build, you know, various architectures that were interesting and whatnot, um, because they, if you have a lot of, if really funky forms, you have high uh, energy intensity. But I'm not aware of the uh, what the justification is behind the uh, the air tightness. Okay, thanks, Randy. Um, Amy, do we have any other questions in the chat? Uh, yeah, there's one from somebody who's left, but if you guys want to 
take a shot at it anyway. I don't see why not. Um, it's from Jason. Lead doesn't require a performance review of the mechanical and building performance at one year in order to obtain a rating. With green globes, a lot of these issues would be tested and any issues would become apparent after a year of operation. Is there any incentive in building future buildings to a higher standard like green globes? I, I could speak to lead a little bit because I used to be a lead consultant and sat on CGBC. Um, so obviously like lead and green globes are quite different. Um, I can just put it that way and not to favor one over the other. If you've worked with the two, uh, green globes, they're, they're just quite different. You know, lead is a lot more documentation, a lot more effort. Uh, green globes a built a little bit less. So uh, I wouldn't say that that's a pro or a con. I would say the vision within lead, from what I understand right now, is that people would get the new building and design certified and construction, and then, you know, kind of lead for life, that then you would go and get lead, EBOM, and uh, your, your future certifications don't depend on modeling, they depend on your actual performance. And that's the intent of where that would be uh, where that would be captured. So I don't know if that really speaks to an advantage of Green Globes versus uh, versus lead. I think, you know, there's other reasons why you might choose one versus the other. Yeah, I know that there's a lot of challenges, regardless of which certification system you choose in rolling over from construction and into operations and maintenance, particularly for condos where um, they're trying to figure out their relationship with their property management team in those first few years and you often see churn. So as an industry, I don't think we have a great answer, even Green Globes for ensuring that there's a long-term tools available to the teams that are operating the buildings about what the initial intent was and what their energy targets can reasonably be. Um, so effective standards about energy dashboards uh, within buildings so that it's easy and quick for uh, operators to understand exactly how much energy they should be using um, and what that sort of should encompasses might, might help. Um, I also don't know, and maybe maybe Randy knows, maybe he doesn't, uh, why the M&V credits were changed in LEED. So they had more of a focus on measurement and verification in the version 2009 than they do in V4 in some ways, insofar as there's a one-year deliverable in that previous program that's been, that's been cut away, which may have to do with the difficulty in sort of keeping that relationship with the building as you move forward into operations. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't speak to that one. It's not that it, it's more that I don't know. Not, yeah, not no. informed enough about that. <laughs> it, it's a really it's a really good point. So as the construction side, we need to be building more bridges with the operations and maintenance side. Um, and and it's, it's definitely an open question. And okay, I can so, also say, oh, go ahead, Bettina. Oh, sorry. sorry. Well, and FIT will also have this the recognition that uh, sometimes it's a different set of uh, stakeholders that are going to be certifying a year later or three years later. So both well and fit well require recertification at the three-year mark. And uh, fit well has even divided it into, you can do uh, the building itself and then sort of an operations recertification to these. It's hard to, Certification is always good because it provides a benchmark and a measurable benchmark and things that you can aim for, but there's no perfect system. Speaking of perfect systems, um, we have a question, uh, your opinion on uh, Toronto Green Standard version 4. Um, do you think that uh, version 4 should move toward an enforced target um, approach or stick with a non-enforced target? And, and yeah, so to, question a little confusing, but no, normally the criticism I hear of Toronto Green Standard, it's done at site plan approval, which is pretty early stage so that you can move forward. And then, you know, like you put in all that effort, so you're probably going to maintain a lot of that moving forward and find a lot of good ideas that you're going to implement into the building. But to my knowledge, it doesn't have a lot of teeth um, to be enforced uh, later, even at, you know, final design stage when you're submitting for tender. Um, so, yeah, anyway, if the person wanted to follow up the question and clarify, but maybe it were, maybe I'm heading off in the wrong direction, or maybe Kara or Bettina have a better idea than I do. I had this, I had the same question. Uh, you know, it would be, 
it would be great if we were all being held to the same standard. And that's what TGS tier one is intended to achieve, but it doesn't have teeth and it is evaluated very early. Um, so I think that the most it's doing, and it is very good, is driving better decisions in the industry and providing higher incentive for uh, high performance uh, building systems to be available to the Toronto market. But it would be really helpful to have uh, the loop closed at the end of the design process. Unfortunately, the City of Toronto doesn't have the regulatory capacity to be allowed to do that, and that's that's actually why it sits at that SPA phase. Uh, that's where that's where they have teeth. Yeah, I can tell you that in Seattle, the way that they've enforced whole building air tightness testing, and even to to a certain standard, is that you get one of your development charges back once they get the report from an independent consultant showing a certain value, and it's enough money, like in the tens of thousands, that it's worthwhile going through the exercise. So I don't know how something like that could work potentially in Toronto, or, you know, jurisdictions and who has authority to do what. Um, that, that's outside of my uh, my my expertise anyway. Um, so a point of clarification is uh, tier two and above are third party reviewed, but ATT is reported on, but not enforced in version three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know that that recommendation was made because uh, in Seattle, uh, they initially didn't have a target either. So they used the first round of getting the tightness testing done to figure out what was reasonable to ask out of the industry. And uh, I know that the, that's the intent with that first phase of target setting in TGS as well. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question uh, that sort of was asked earlier by someone who seems to have left, uh, but I wonder if uh, perhaps we could ask it anyway. I think um, I did that one. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Amy, I'll let you. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you see if there's another one in the chat. Then. Yeah, no, I think we have covered everything that has come in. Yeah. Okay. Well then, and we're just about on time. If anyone has any. Um, last questions now is your, your one last chance uh, to jump in and type something up in the chat um, or if you can raise your hand we can open up your mic okay no further questions well i would like to thank our our presenters uh, randy van stratton kara sloat and bettina hork uh, for this wonderful uh, presentation, and Mary Sy and Enbridge for sponsoring this and the Savings by Design program. Um, and thank everyone who uh, registered for today uh, for joining us and for all of the questions. Uh, just so you know, this webinar will be made, a recording will be made available to you and will be sent out to all registered participants. And uh, we hope to see you tomorrow on Air Tightness Part 2. Thank you very much and have a great day.